In 1 Timothy 3, 1 to 7, it reads as follows. This saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to be an overseer, he desires a noble work. An overseer, therefore, must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, self-controlled, sensible, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not an excessive drinker, not a bully, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not greedy. He must manage his own household competently and have his children under control with all dignity. If anyone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of God's church? He must not be a new convert, or he might become conceited and incur the same condemnation as the devil. Furthermore, he must have a good reputation among outsiders so that he does not fall into disgrace and the devil's trap. This morning, we're going to pick up our study through 1 Timothy in chapter 3 with verses 1 to 7, reflecting on these qualifications for pastors. Now, to be clear, this text mentions the words overseers, or in other texts, it mentions the word elders, and overseers and elders are to be used interchangeably. And for those who've attended TBC for some time, you're more than likely aware the word elder in our modern vernacular is the word we would refer to as pastor pastor, a shepherd. So today what we're going to do is we're going to look at the qualifications for pastors in the local church. Now, what I want us to understand is, first off, this is this is not like Titus, where he is uh, appointing new elders in churches. Timothy's task is a bit different. In fact, Ephesus already had elders. If you read this epistle or Acts 20, you see Paul had already established pastors in these churches. Rather, Timothy, as we see, as we mentioned from the outset, was given the really exciting job to remove certain pastors from the ministry in the church of Ephesus. Yeah, that's right. What we see is this was one of the twofold main purposes of this letter, that Paul was to get Timothy to instruct certain pastors not to teach. In other words, to remove them from leadership. Now, the reason these false teachers were needing to be removed, as we saw the last several weeks, is they were not fulfilling their calling. They were not ministering for the gospel. Rather, we see they were using their, the ministry for their own selfish gains. They were ministering for themselves, and more than likely that entails financial gains. So we have to see Timothy has a very, very, very difficult job to do. He has to go before local churches under Paul's apostolic authority and remove false teachers that Paul himself may have established. Who here really wants to sign up for that? I mean, in this passage, we see Timothy is supposed to approach the situation. If we notice, he's not instructed to begin by addressing their particular ministries or even at first a particular message or teaching. But what I want us to understand, which I think is so important, is Paul wants Timothy to address it by their character, their character. What we have to see is Timothy is not going to remove pastors for a few too many, for just a few too less baptisms or not enough offerings, or they don't have enough energy anymore. Rather, he's going to remove pastors who have forfeited their integrity for the gospel. They have character issues. In other words, instead of going first after how they operate, he's going to go after who they are. And then we see Timothy is tasked to replace these false teachers with men who meet these qualifications, which we see in our text today. You see, ladies and gentlemen, the problem in Ephesus begins and ends with character. As Paul lists these qualifications, he's writing things which these false teachers are clearly operating without, and that's character. In this list of qualifications, many of the items which we read stand in sharp contrast to what it says elsewhere in the letter about these false teachers. So the notable features of these seven verses are as followed and break it down to two sections. One, this passage gives qualifications and not duties, qualifications and not duties. And two, the majority of the qualifications listed reflect outward observable behavior. So first off, let's look at our first point. This passage gives qualifications 
and not duties. Like I said in this passage, the duties of the pastor are not listed. You won't find them per se here. We don't see uh, like we do in Acts 20 or Acts 6 that elders are supposed to guard and keep the flock. We don't see requirement for pastoral prayer. We don't see duties such as visitation or even church administration at all listed. I mean, if it's really, if we're really honest, it's really amazing the duties that we don't see for a pastor mentioned in this passage. Notice that we don't see the requirements for a great public speaker. In other words, we don't see that the pastor must be able to hold an audience with their attention while they speak. So no requirement for great motivational speaker. No requirement for a great fundraiser. And honestly, we don't even see a requirement for having a great education. Don't have to have a doctorate. We don't see any of this. But what we do see are character qualifications. What we do see is these men are supposed to have integrity, a good reputation. We see a pastor is to continue to be a man of peace, a person who embodies the peaceful, loving lifestyle that has already been detailed through this epistle. We see qualifications which clearly these false teachers did not possess. And since these false teachers did not possess these qualities, they are no longer fit for the role. So ladies and gentlemen, let's really hold on to this. Let me be clear here. Character is far more important than charisma. Love is far more important than public speaking. And integrity is far greater than image. In short, when it comes to pastors, character qualifications are far more important than a stacked resume. What we see Paul doing in this passage is we see he is laying down an indictment against these false teachers. And here he is giving Timothy the list of qualifications he can use to address these situations. So let's jump straight into the passage and examine point two. The majority of the qualifications listed reflect outward, observable behavior. In short, when it comes to pastors, character qualifications are important. In other words, these attributes are what can be seen on a daily basis. Remember, the second major purpose of this letter is Timothy was to instruct the Christians in Ephesus how to live as Christians. And this obviously includes the pastors, too. Pastors would be first and foremost to be image bearers of Christ, not image bearers of culture. No celebrity pastors. That's not what we're called to be. We're called to be servants. In other words, as the five pastors of this church, our duty is to live out these qualifications. As we strive to live out these qualifications, we are hopefully giving you, the congregation, an example to follow. Again, our goal is to image Christ. As we image Christ, we are actively engaging in our mission, the Great Commission. The point is, the concern for character and the, and the resultant lifestyle looming large in this epistle is character. It reaches its high point in this chapter. The book's key verses in this chapter, which you said, John, Pastor Jonathan said from the beginning is 1 Timothy 3.15. It says, I have written so that you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of truth. Paul's entire point of writing is so people can be once again instructed how to live as followers of Christ. Not self-indulged, loud rabble-rousers, which we looked at last week. So let's jump into the text and look at some of these qualifications, because there are 14. First is good reputation. This command to have a good reputation, like all these, is actually a requirement for all the followers of Christ. I mean, later in chapter 5, we see the widows of the church are called to have a good reputation. In fact, most of these qualifications that we're going to look at today are attributes which the New Testament church calls every Christian to adhere to at one point or another. In other words, we should all strive to have all these attributes. That's our calling. But the men who step before the Lord and serve as these pastors, overseers, elders, they must be imaging these attributes. And that's key. They must image these attributes. Why? Because Jesus did. And we're to image him. The point is, if all Christians are exhibit these traits, the leadership should too, right? So as we move through the list, hopefully you can use this list to help you in your own personal life. After all, we're all called to be like Christ. What are things in this list that you need to work on? What are things in this list 
that you can improve upon. And let's start with the first one, good reputation. Good reputation means this person to be a kind of person whom no one suspects of wrongdoing or immorality. And again, that should be calling for all of us, right? I mean, let's be let's just give it a, a very feasible example here. Let's think about our work, where we work. At work, let's say whatever your work is, something happens. Something goes down. Maybe something is missing. I don't know. Something bad happens. A person of a good reputation is typically the last person people expect to be involved. So let's say something goes down at your work. Are you the first person that people assume did something wrong? Or are you the last on the list? I don't know. I mean, that's just something we need to think about. How is your reputation where you work? How is your reputation in the church? How is your reputation among people? Point number two is good marriage. The actual Greek here is, says a one-woman man. One-woman man. And, and our first instinct would be to think of polygamy. But uh, Pastor John MacArthur points out that this one-woman man aspect does not refer to marital status as much as it does to moral and sexual purity. So this one-woman man idea does not necessarily ma- mean quantitative, as you have multiple wives. Although we can look at other passages and see that's wrong too. But the phrase is actually more qualitative. Like all of these, these are qualitative, not quantitative. Like every other item in this list, it should be seen as a quality of a pastor. And you go, a quality of a pastor is a one woman man? What does that mean? Well, let me look at it this way. In other words, if married, there's only one woman in his life. He is totally committed to one woman. He is a covenant keeper. And I think that's what we need to see there. He's faithful to his wife. He's faithful to his covenant with her. People who are faithful to their covenants are like people who you want in leadership. If a guy's going to be faithful to his wife, he's going to be faithful to the church. He's going to be faithful to his service. You want people who are covenant keepers, not covenant breakers. Three, self-controlled. This means not reactionary. This is a big one. As we saw last week with this church in Ephesus, we saw the men of Ephesus were very prone to be reactionary. They were prone to lift up arms in anger or violence when things did not go the way they assumed. And this is sin. Being reactionary is not having self-control. It's not being able to control one's emotions or reactions. Pastors need to have this ability to say no, to step back, to not react. Four, sensible. This, like self-control, is a characteristic which a person will think things through. Be patient. Connects to the other one. Find a better way when reacting in anger or violence. They're clear-headed. Some translations say sober-minded. They will find a better solution, a better way, or we could say a peaceful solution. Five is respectable. This describes a person who is honest, good, and proper. In other words, they handle things with dignity, with order. Their reactions stand out in a very positive way. Six, hospitable. The Greek word here for hospitable is philosinos, which means lover of strangers. Hmm. This is a virtue of the people of God. It's a fruit of the spirit. I mean, after Romans 13, three says a Christian were to contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Sadly to say, I think this is one of the things missing in the modern church. We've talked about this in our one another passages. We have to be hospitable. This means we're to pursue opportunities to fellowship with other believers, but not just other believers. We're to pursue fellowship with non-believers. This means Christians are having an open life with one another, at least. We're to share our lives with one another as a community. We're a family. This means to invite each other to dinner, have people at your home, break bread, be open. And again, this is a bit easier back in in the days of like the church of Ephesus because churches were in homes. So typically the people that were letting people in were very hospitable. They had house churches. Today, we kind of lose some of this by having a defined meeting place like the buildings that we have at church. Don't get me wrong. These buildings are nice, but I think we do lose some vulnerability when we don't have people in our homes. With all that said, we should all invite fellow believers and even non-believers into our homes, into our lives, break bread with them, show love to them. This is openness and vulnerability. This is expected of Christians. 
especially of pastors. This is a very qualitative. Seven, able to instruct. This is the only qualification on the list that a lot of times we think implies duty or role. I mean, all the other qualifications or character requirements, this is the only one that duty is involved. Or is it? Again, I want us to continue to think this in the idea of not quantitative, not a duty, but qualitative. It's as a quality. How can you have the able to instruct as a quality? Now, hold on a second. I mean, I always find that interesting because honestly, the first thing people do when they are looking at or for a pastor is if this person can preach, can he preach? Having been through several pastoral searches in my day, the main things people focus on are if a person can rally an audience, can he bring about a revival, which I don't know if a man can do that anyway, it's the Holy Spirit, but anyway, or bring some emotion, bring some clarity. This means most people only look at one of the 14 qualifications. Ladies and gentlemen, there are 13 other qualifications. And one is listed twice, and it's not able to instruct. My point is, even we are guilty of overlooking some of these other 13 qualifications or characteristics. If this one of preaching and able to communicate or whatever this means is a sound. But what we have to understand, as Paul's pointing out here in Titus, this cannot be the case. The reason in Ephesus is the situation is because some of these people who were able to instruct like Hymenaeus and Alexander, are misleading the churches. Many are clearly lacking in some of these other 13 characteristics. My point is, ladies and gentlemen, a pastor should be able to instruct. This means ability to teach truth and refute error. But again, it's also a quality. This should be seen as a quality. Does the pastor live his life instructing? And this is something that I think we should all think about. What does your life teach others? What does your life instruct others? As you walk around, as you have your interactions, how do you instruct others? It's a good introspective one. What we have to understand is pastors must be able to instruct others. And they must be able to teach others by the way they live. And honestly, they must be able to teach others how to live like Christ. That's what their life must teach. Pastors must shepherd. And that's what we have to understand. There's far more to pastoring or shepherding God's flock than just preaching a knockout sermon. It's discipling. It's teaching. It's living a life that teaches. Instructing the flock is so very important, but we have to do it with our lives. Let's jump into number eight. It's an odd one, too. Not an excessive drinker. I mean, this means at the very least, a pastor should not be someone who is prone to overindulgence. We're not going to get off track here and say that a pastor needs to be a teetotaler and all this. But, but let's be honest. Many people do have addictive personalities. Many people do overindulge in certain things, and not just alcohol. I'm guilty. What we see here is a pastor needs to be temperate, in control, not easily swayed. People who overdrink or overindulge in alcohol tend to lose control. And in losing control, they slip many times into one of the next two categories that are listed. They become quarrelsome or they become bullies. Partly, I believe this characteristic comes before the next two is because people who lose control easily typically are more reactionary going back to the problems that we've seen going on in Ephesus. And alcohol and drugs quickly allow people to let down walls and lose control. Am I right? Pastors should be temperament, even keeled, and they should not overindulge in things, especially things which could compromise their reputation. Because, again, they're first and foremost to be image bearers of Christ. And Christ was not a drunkard or a person who lost control. Christ stood against chaos and disorder. Nine, not a bully, but gentle. Being a gentle person is, is clearly underrated. Being a gentle person is so easily overlooked by our society today. In some ways, our greater society is drawn to bullies. But let's be, let me be clear. It should not be that way in the church. Christ was meek and humble. He was not a bully. 
not loud, obnoxious, and demanding. Matthew eleven twenty nine 29 says Jesus was gentle and lowly of heart. The world bullies people. The church should not. Church leaders should not. Tim Quarrelsome. This follows a similar vein. It's been stated that when you have to argue to prove a point, you've already lost the argument. Arguing is more often than not fruitless. Even if you win the argument, the other person's lost. And when trying to share and live the gospel of peace, what kind of testimony is it to a person who has to always win? We must be careful not to be quarrelsome with people. It is fruitless for the gospel. We need to be showing gentleness, love, peace. We must be instructing a better way with our lives. So pastors should not be quarrelsome. 11, not greedy for money. This is one that we see from the later passage in the epistle, as well as the next epistle, that some of these leaders are guilty of. It is inferred that many of the elders are engaging in practices that are lining their pockets quite well. So. Let's just be honest. If you want to make a lot of money in this life, being a pastor should not be your calling. Paul speaks so strongly against this. I mean, let's just look at chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. Turn with your Bibles to chapter 6, 9 and 10. It says, but those who want to be rich fall into temptation, a trap, and many foolish and harmful desires which plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, and by craving it, Some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Oh, that's tragic. Paul makes it very clear here. The love of money draws you away from the faith and into chaos, into the troubles. Pastors cannot be driven by money. Which I guess is good here as we only have one staff pastor here, Pastor Jonathan. Only one of the five pastors employed by the church. The rest are non-paid. Now, Pastor Jonathan is paid. And because with Pastor Jonathan and even Sophia here, they have to keep the lights on in this place. They keep this, this building running. But your other four pastors, they don't get paid. This is their calling. What, what Dan and I do up here, what the elders do here, coming up before you, delivering the word of God, this is our calling. We don't have to get paid for our calling. You should not have to get paid to serve God. You should serve God because it's what you're called to do as his image bearers, as his disciples. So ladies and gentlemen, whether you be a deacon, whether you are working in children's ministry, this is your calling. Your payment is service to the creator of all things. Your payment is service to Jesus Christ, King of Kings. Like the apostle Paul, Most of the pastors here receive no money for our duties. We do not serve for money because it's a calling. God has blessed us with other revenues, and that's great. So we have no desire or no need for their funds. Which brings us to the final three, 12, 13, and 14. First one is must manage his own household. If you notice, he spends more time on the final three. Look at that. First three, the first... uh, the, the the first 11 were in three verses and the final three get four. He communicates a lot more descriptive. He uses only three words for the duty of a pastor should be able to teach and loses one sentence each for these last three qualifications. In fact, this 12th one, he uses two verses. That's as many as the first 11 combined. Because of this, we should see the last three is significant. So let's look at them again. Four, he must manage his own household competently and have his children under control with all dignity. If anyone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of God's church? I mean, this passage, I think, is fairly clear. The church is a family. It's referred to throughout scripture as a family. I mean, we are a group of brothers and sisters in Christ submitted to God the Father by the working of God the Holy Spirit. Every family requires leadership, including a church family. I mean, this is honestly why you see in the Catholic Church the idea of priests have become known as fathers because they seem as the father of the family. Now, I'm, I'm not saying I want to be your father. I'm not a father. The only father is God the Father. But what I do want is to see is you should see pastors as, as mature older brothers. Older or elders, which was commonly called elders, leaders of the church. 
After all, a pastor is called to shepherd God's family and his household. Take care of the brothers and sisters. Paul insists that a pastor must be able to manage his own household if he expects to manage the church family. The word manage is the same word used in the Good Samaritan. How many are familiar with the Good Samaritan? In Luke 10, we see the Good Samaritan who risked his own life to care for a wounded stranger, a stranger who actually was his enemy. This Good Samaritan responded as the wounded travelers hurt and pain with care and concern. And this is precisely what an elder is called to do in the church. Pastors are to supervise, guard, nurture, manage the family. As, like we see here, overseers, overseers of the family. And this responsibility to manage God's household led directly then into the next qualification. A pastor, elder, must not be a new convert. He must be mature in the faith. I mean, the logic of this next, next qualification is evident. He must not be a new convert, or he might become conceited and incur the same condemnation as the devil. Ouch. I mean, the language here is so expressive and passionate. It would appear that perhaps that this has been a problem in the house churches in Ephesus. And I think it's safe to assume that. Some of these elders were, dare we say, new converts. And they were not mature. And they became conceited. And the warning here is they're going to get the same condemnation as the devil. Ouch. This is a problem. Newer believers don't necessarily know how to handle things biblically. I mean, let's be honest. The old man is strong. The flesh is strong. We have to kind of work at our salvation, so to speak, work at what it means to be a Christian, work at what it means to be a disciple, to truly begin to think and to live and to instruct our lives like followers of Christ. I mean, perhaps the problem is in many of these congregations, a lot of these newer pastors ran into an issue, an issue that they didn't necessarily see right away in scripture, and they reacted by the flesh. They went back to the way things work in the flesh, and they ignored the answer of how it was to be biblically. And this is just a show of immaturity. But we all have to be honest. There are many times we get in situations when we should lean into what the Bible says. And instead, we go to our default. We go back to how we used to do things, whether it be handling money, whether it be how we react to people, whether it be being gentle or not guilty. In fact, we can't lean on our own understanding, but we do. We do. It implies that many of these leaders had become prideful. They become conceited. They thought they knew how to run things and not do things necessarily biblically. And let me be honest, and I think this is where it kind of hits in with the devil here. Pride never ends well. The point is pastors like Jesus must be humble. Pastor Brian Chapel says, humility seasoned by experience is an indispensable qualification for eldership. Such a big part of the role that it gets a whole verse to address it. And finally, the last one, good reputation. A little bit of deja vu here. Well, this is the one that we get on here twice. We got kind of an envelope, an inclusio. The final qualification takes us first circle back to one's reputation. As noted earlier, I always find it fascinating that the qualification as mentioned, mentioned twice is not teaching, not instruction, but reputation. Character comes and is demonstrated by reputation. It says he must have a good reputation among outsiders. So reputation in the community of the church and reputation in the community of the world. Good reputation in church, good reputation in community. This is key for two reasons. If the pastor has a good reputation in the world, he's living in an ethical and moral way, which stands out, which means he's probably not a brawler, argumentative, or drunkard or harsh. He stands out. Even more importantly, it means he's living the gospel life in the world, which is what we are to do. We are to be ambassadors of Christ in the world. In other words, he's not hiding from the lost world, but he's engaging with it. He's sharing the gospel as a witness to the world. His life instructs. He is expediting the gospel to the community. The whole point is so he does not fall into disgrace and the devil's trap. Notice that last part, the devil's trap. Where did we heard that before? What is the devil's trap? As we read earlier in chapter six, one of the devil's traps was the love of money. Yeah, we'll see that again when we get to chapter six. I'm sure there are many, 
That being said, in context, it's safe to assume many of these fallen leaders fell in love with money. And sadly, it's the same tragedy in today's church. Sadly, in our evangelical world, we've seen many Christian leaders fall into disgrace and the devil's trap. But what Paul's saying here is men who meet these 14 qualifications are less likely to fall in this trap. Why? Because they're held accountable by three groups. One, each other. Two, the congregation. And three, the local community. A pastor is not to be a recluse who only appears on Sundays. A pastor is to shepherd the flock and be a witness to the community. A pastor is to be a lover of strangers, as we saw in our passage today, and is to manage the family of God for God's glory. In closing, I think it's very important for us to note a few things about these churches in Ephesus. As we continue throughout this uh, series, we got kind of this three-part mini-series within the bigger series going on. This week, we hit on the basic background of elders. Next week, we're going to hit on deacons. And finally, we're going to put it, contextualize it for us here at TBC. Or We've gone through in a month the first two chapters, and then we're going to slow down for 13 voices to 13 verses, excuse me, to really get at this idea of qualifications for leadership, whether it be pastor or deacons in the church. Why? Because we don't want to be like the church of Ephesus and be deficient in some of these. We don't want to have to remove false teachers. We, we want to make sure our, our teachers are doing what they are by meeting these qualifications. And likewise, we want to make sure we have deacons serving the church as well when we get to next week. And so we will spend more time looking at this and those contextually. But the point is, we have to understand these churches in context. First off, the churches of an Ephesus were not the size of churches today. They averaged around 20 people. None were larger than 50, from the historical records tell us, at least in Ephesus. Which means, guess what, ladies and gentlemen? If we were in Ephesus, we'd be a mega church, right? A mega church. Now, these bigger churches with 50 had to probably be in a large house or an estate. Kind of like how Lydia or someone wealthy. There are more than remember these. These were home churches. You couldn't get a lot of people into homes. Again, it's almost like you're more like growth groups today that we would consider these home groups. Each of these house churches, however, went healthy, where it consisted of multiple pastors or elders. So a church of twenty people would have at least two pastors. Two pastors out of twenty. There's some historical evidence from early churches that there were some churches of like the estimated around 15 people that had three pastors. I mean, that's that's great ratio. I mean, it could be one reason. I mean, that's great. Either either there are a lot of people that need shepherding of those 15, but they needed some one on five, or it's just a blessing to have that kind of oversight, that type of maturity within a group of believers. Now, inside Ephesus, there could have been between 20 to 40 churches, they tell us. But we have to understand that there were multiple elders in each site. There was not one pastor, over 100 people. Again, that's something that's come later due to pragmatism. And again, that's something that can be looked at later. I just wanted to be noted. This is a different concept for us to understand. I mean, a lot of deconstructing and reconstructing that we've been talking about. We got to deconstruct how we think about the church. I mean, let's be honest. We think of a church, we think of a building, we think of one guy. Uh, the more numbers you get one guy with 500 people are doing great. But, and then maybe you can add another guy. But again, we got to deconstruct that. We need a plurality of elders for several reasons. Accountability being the greatest. But we also have to do it because that's how God established it. I mean, the thing that we have to see here is we need to see that pastors need to make qualifications. It's about quality. Pastors need to meet these standards. My point is, is I think we need to focus on what these did and establish what would be called indigenous leadership. Indigenous leadership. This is what we do in worldwide missions today. This is the missionaries that we support. They go over there and they kind of raise up local elders, let the pastors become pastors, run the church, and they move to other places. Pastors have to come out of the congregation. And again, this is a deconstruct, reconstruct idea. What we don't want is we don't want mercenary pastors. We don't see mercenary pastors in the Bible. We don't see somebody from the Church of Rome coming in being a pastor in one of the churches in Ephesus. One, it's a different culture, different area. But two, you need to be able to have a reputation in the community you live. 
And I know that's really hard for us to grasp. I know it's really hard for us to deconstruct, but these are things we have to focus on. Deconstruct our viewpoints on how things are pragmatically working in the modern world and reconstruct them biblically. Indigenous leadership, as far as pastors, indigenous definitely as far as deacons and other servants, our staff should come from within the church. And again, I don't want us to say that people are doing this uh, in spite of scripture. It's not done intentionally, but again, it's pragmatically. We have to be aware of this. We must heed the warning of the text too. Futures and elders must be tested, mature, and proven. In other words, and that may be sort of part of the problem. Sometimes we try to push people too quickly. Obviously, that's what happened here in Ephesus. We had immature people taking over, and it didn't end well. But that's what Timothy's job was to come in and take care of it. We have to be careful, but we have to be willing. And this is something we have to look at. And again, we'll begin looking at this as we continue through this three-week process. But what we do have to understand is we are a church. We are God's church. We are not a business. We don't need men to save us. We shouldn't go hire a CEO. We don't need an Elon Musk or or a Jeff Bezos or somebody like that. But we, we shouldn't go look to hire outside solutions. What we should do is we should look to raise men in our church to the office of shepherd. Again, indigenous is the key. Indigenous leadership. Let me remind you as we go through these weeks to pray for your pastors. They go through a lot. Pray for them. They're like you. They deal with issues just like you do. And like I said, four of our pastors work. They were had deal with the same daily problems you deal with. So please pray for them. We covet your prayers. And again, we as a church must recognize the role of shepherd brother in the flock. And we must pray the Lord begins to raise up other pastors and leaders in TBC as well. God bless you.